Thank you so much for joining us today, Congressman Simpson. Can you tell me about the lead up to this proposal? Because this isn't something that you came up with just overnight. No, it's a very complex and, uh, and detailed uh, proposal. We have uh, what we've released so far is just a concept. It has various ideas in it and what we might be able to do uh, to both provide certainty for uh, communities, for energy production, for uh, for agriculture uh, in this proposal. And we've had, uh, we've been working for three years. Uh, we've had uh, over 300 meetings with stakeholder groups, individuals, uh, and so forth, uh, trying, trying to look at and ask the questions. If the dams came out, what would the consequences be and how would you address uh, the needs of the stakeholders and the impacts that it would have on those stakeholders? So we've done a lot of, a lot of research on this. Uh, you know, we looked at all sorts of different ways to try to save salmon. Uh, try to recover the salmon runs in Idaho. And unfortunately, over the years, what we've been doing is managing the steady decline of salmon to where they're eventually going to go extinct if we don't do something along these lines. Uh, we came to the, we looked at ways that, that you might be able to recover salmon without removing dams. Couldn't find an alternative that would work. The reality is, is that we tried everything else. Uh, and we came down to the conclusion, and, and most fish biologists would agree with us, that if you're going to recover salmon, uh, you're going to have to remove the dams. So that has consequences. And what this proposal does, and it's the first time that anybody has done this, it, it looks at the, the fact that the dams have a value. And how are you going to compensate for that value if you remove the dams? By, as I said, uh, by uh, restoring uh, the, the uh, uh, making the, the stakeholders whole, whether it's agriculture, uh, and if you look at this proposal, agriculture benefits from this greatly, uh, re re relieves them of the lawsuits, provides certainty uh, for them in the future. Uh, it, pro it provides for replacing the energy. These dams produce 3,000 megawatts of power. Uh, it ends the salmon wars that have been going on in the West for the last 30 or 40 years. That's a, that is a very complex and comprehensive uh, uh, proposal, uh, which makes it that much more difficult. You know, this is, as you said, a, a big ask, at least $33.5 billion. And yeah. that's an expensive gamble when you're trying to not only save the salmon, but also offset some of the consequences of removing the dams with agriculture, with industry, yeah. with power. Yeah. How sure are you that those investments will work when it comes to water storage, when it comes to replacing the hydropower? Well, what the thirty-three and a half billion dollars? The way we came up with that is uh, that's the value of the dams. If you look at trying to make the stakeholders whole, it'll take you about thirty-three and a half million uh, billion dollars. Uh, and you know, it is. It is. Uh, I would like to tell you that I'm certain that if we do this and implement this, the salmon would be recovered. I can't do that. Uh, it's a complex biological system and certainty is not uh, not in the cards, but it's the best chance we have of uh, recovering and restoring uh, the environment in the Pacific Northwest and giving giving salmon a chance to to uh, uh, succeed and, and recover. Are you anticipating job losses in the short term because of those dam removals? No, we're not. Uh, if you look at this dam removal doesn't start until 2030. That's nine years from now. Uh, and then half of them come out in 2030, the other half in 2031, uh, I believe it is. Uh, we would have to replace the power before then. Uh, and we do that by, uh, by giving the Bonneville Power Administration uh, the resources that they would need to replace the power. We also uh, take away the lawsuits in that we relicense all of the dams that are more than five megawatts in power. Uh, we relicense them for the next 35 to 50 years, depending on when their licenses come due. That is a big deal for power, uh, the power companies and so forth. So we would have to replace that uh, beforehand and we would have to implement many of these other programs before uh, you actually started removing the dams. 
You know, I'm, I'm curious about the uh, balance of power, if you will, here. Um, yeah. You know, you've mentioned poor ocean conditions and climate change increasing the water temperatures of the uh, rivers and reservoirs, which also has a negative impact on salmon. Without the relatively clean hydropower that's currently provided by the dams, uh, you know, what climate considerations should be taken when you are removing a clean power source? Well, you can replace that with other clean power sources. You can you can put, replace it with pump storage. You can replace it with small modular reactors. You can replace it by making the dams that will remain uh, more efficient in their power production. Uh, I'm not the energy expert in the world, but I know the Bonneville Power Administration is. And, and replacing the energy is actually not the most difficult part of this whole whole uh, process. Uh, replacing the, the uh, barging that occurs from Lewiston to, to the Tri-Cities uh, that gets our grain down the, the river at a cheaper cost than uh, by rail or truck uh, is more problematic and more difficult to do. But that's one of the things we've been working on and giving the resources to our agricultural producers to design their own system of how they want to get, uh, how they want to get grain down the, down the river and enhancing the barging from the Tri-Cities down to the end of, uh, of uh, the Columbia to the uh, Pacific Ocean. But you know, everybody can point to, the, well, let me put it this way, there are many factors that affect salmon recovery. Ocean conditions is one of them, water temperatures, uh, temperature is one of them, predators is one of them, dams are one of them. And everybody has the ability to point to something to say, no, that's the cause of it, so let's address that. You know, And we've done that for 40 years. Ocean conditions are bad right now for salmon. Uh, we have the Pacific decadial uh, oscillation that occurs, and that happens every 30 to 40 years where salmon runs go down in the Pacific Northwest and then they come back up as ocean conditions change. But you can always point to that and say, well, it's ocean conditions, we can't do anything about that, so let's just throw, our, throw up our hands and not worry about it. Uh, it is a combination of all of those things. Dams are the biggest factor. Uh, a salmon coming from the high mountain, clean water habitats of Idaho uh, going to the Pacific Ocean has to cross eight dams. It takes three times as long for a juvenile salmon to get uh, from Idaho to the Pacific Ocean that, than it used to when we had a free running river. The reality is we don't have a free running river anymore. What we've got is a series of pools, slack water pools behind dams. Uh, that means that it takes longer to get to the ocean. It means that water temperatures are higher. They're more susceptible to, uh, to predators uh, in that uh, case. And we lose about 15 to, uh, 10 to 15% of the juveniles uh, die every time they have to go through the turbines of a, of a dam and stuff. When you times that by eight dams that they have to go through, it's just an unsustainable situation. You know, one of the other parts of your proposal is a 35-year mor moratorium on litigation. How does that work? And is there any precedent for this in other pieces of congressional legislation? I don't know if there's any precedent of it. We can cert certainly legislate it that we, we exempt uh, those dams, that we relicense those, those uh, remaining dams for 35 to 50 years. And they won't be susceptible to litigation under the Clean Water Act, uh, under the Endangered Species Act, uh, so that it provides some certainty. And frankly, the people that uh, and organizations that have been the most active in pursuing litigation uh, have agreed to that and think that's a good move uh, because they actually believe, and I and I agree with them that. Uh, we will see uh, salmon return to Idaho and, and uh, remove the greatest barrier to their, to their uh, uh, coming back by removing the dams. You know, that's a snapshot in time right now, though, with the groups that are currently engaged in litigation. And 35 years is a long time. So what if in 20 years another group comes along and says, you know what, I see major problems with this. Will they have the ability to sue? not under the Clean Water Act or under the Endangered Species Act. You know, I also have to ask, there are so many regions that this affects um, Eastern yeah. Washington and Idaho's first congressional district. Why is this proposal coming from the congressman from Idaho's second congressional district? Well, we started looking at, uh, looking, you know, three years ago uh, about the impacts of, uh, of the dams on salmon recovery. And most of the 
uh, high altitude, clear water uh, habitat from the salmon is actually in the second congressional district. It's up in the Stanley Basin with Marsh Creek and Loon Creek and the other places. Uh, so it affects uh, my district, the second district. Obviously it affects uh, the first district and, and uh, Eastern Washington. Uh, so, you know, we're getting the reaction kind of what we expected uh, from groups. There's concern, uh, there are, there's opposition all of that kind of stuff. What we want people to sit back and look at is, okay, this is a serious proposal to recover salmon. You gotta ask yourself one question. Do you really wanna recover salmon or do you wanna let them go extinct? That's the, really, that's the decision we have to make. Uh, because as I said, we've just been managing salmon for extinction. Uh, and and uh, I think we ought to recover salmon. They're the most iconic species in the Pacific Northwest. But in doing that, we have to provide some certainty for the stakeholders uh, in this uh, going forward. You know, this proposal comes in the aftermath of a bruising impeachment debate that wasn't just bipartisan, it it split, or rather partisan, it, it split your own party as well. Yeah. And I read one reaction to your proposal that said that regional bipartisanship is out of style right now. So in this climate, realistically, how are you going to get this done? Well, what we're looking at uh, is is uh, hoping that people will sit back and take a look at this. I, I understand first reactions, uh, gut reactions that come when you when you see something, uh, but they will sit back and look at the full proposal and what the benefits are uh, in creating that certainty that's necessary, uh, particularly for agriculture, uh, getting rid of the salmon lawsuits and so forth, and then work uh, with a delegation, the governors of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and uh, and the tribes uh, to try to, to try to implement this. Uh, we are looking at the the Biden administration is putting together a uh, a uh, infrastructure and jobs package, which I haven't seen yet exactly what they're going to propose, but they tell me it's upwards of about two trillion dollars. Uh, so thirty five thirty three billion dollars uh, would be a little less than two percent of the entire package. Is that too much to ask for the Pacific Northwest region uh, to redo our economy and, uh, and the infrastructure of our, of our economy? I don't think so. So we hope to work it into a package like that. We've been in touch with uh, Senator Wyden over in the, the uh, uh, that's chairman of the uh, Finance Committee in the Senate. Uh, I know that they have been in touch with uh, the Biden administration. Uh, and then we've talked with, uh, with almost all of the, the representatives of Region. Uh, and there's, you know, a kind of a quiet pause <laughs> for most people that want to consider it uh, and see what the reaction is in the public before they decide whether they're going to oppose it or support it or be helpful in trying to get this done. Do you have a firm answer on whether or not Russ Fulcher will support this proposal? You know, we've briefed Russ. Uh, he represents the first district, as you well know. Uh, and uh, he's, he, I understand his concerns uh, for his constituents and uh, Lewiston and so forth. Uh, I think if we can get groups and organizations supportive of this or supportive of moving in this direction, uh, that, uh, you know, we'll let Russ do what he has. He represents his constituents and, and that's all I can expect him to do. You also mentioned the tribes and of course, different tribes have different concerns. Are they on the same page when it comes to this proposal? All of the tribes that we've talked to, and I met the other day uh, on a Zoom call with, uh, with the 16 tribes in the Pacific Northwest, uh, they're very supportive of what we're doing. Most of them put out press releases supporting the, the concept of, uh, of what we're doing. You mentioned the Biden administration. How different would the timing of this have been had President Trump won a second term? Well, I don't know that the timing would have been uh, been different. Uh, we were getting ready to release this regardless of who won the won the election and so forth. And let me emphasize what this is is a concept, and we are we are putting it out there, and we are we want people to comment on it and to tell us if they have better ideas, uh, things that we could do differently, or or uh, how we can address some of the impacts and stuff. And what we're looking for right now is the response uh, of people so that we can take that into consideration as we start drafting legislation uh, to enact it. How are discussions with the Biden administration going? Are you getting any sort of feedback from them yet? 
I haven't had any contact yet with the Biden administration. They have other things on their on their mind right now. But as they work uh, toward doing a job right now, they're working on the COVID relief uh, package. Uh, when they start working on jobs and infrastructure uh, package, uh, we'll be in contact with them. Oh, you've been critical of the Speaker of the House in the past. I think you've called her crazy uh, in one <laughs> interview. Are you in a place to approach the Democratic majority with such an expensive piece of legislation? I have a good relationship with uh, with the Speaker and the Majority Leader. In fact, one of my best friends in Congress is uh, Steny Hoyer, the the Majority Leader right now, and I get along well with all the all the Democrats on the other side of the aisle. Uh, in spite of what you see on TV and some of the rhetoric that goes out, some of the rhetoric from me, unfortunately, but uh, some of the rhetoric that goes out, uh, we actually get along pretty well on our committees when we sit and work together, and and uh, uh, we're trying to do that. All right, Congressman Mike Simpson, thank you so much for your time. You bet. Thank you, Melissa.